Hello everyone this is part 6 of what if Naruto's mother was soon it send you, and I hope you guys enjoy this video and to like, to subscribe, to see more comment down below, now let's start the intro. About two years after meeting Killer B and his team as well as meeting the Fire Daimyo, Naruto was on his way to Kanoa to become an official ninja there. At first his mother was against the idea but after Jiraiya reminded her that Naruto needed to go there to master his Mokuten bloodline, along with the fact that with the Akatsuki now starting to move around. It would be in Naruto's best interest to join Kanoa where Kanoa could help support him and even help protect him when they eventually come after him whether it was for his Mokuten bloodline or the Kyubi. Eventually after much arguing Sunid finally agreed that Naruto would go to Kanoa, which made Naruto happy as he had wanted to go to the place he was born and that was founded by his ancestors. Currently accompanying Naruto on his journey to Kanoa was Jiraiya, as his mother and Shizune along with Tonton were in Kiba no Kuni, Fang Country, currently dealing with a disease that had spread in a large town in the country, where many people in the town had been affected by it. Once the disease had been dealt with Sunid said that she would meet Naruto in Kanoa. Naruto was fairly tall for his age as he was about 5 foot 2, he wore a black sleeveless vest with a green sleeveless zip up top over it. He also wore green pants and black boots with green elbow pads and green fingerless gloves, also on his back he carried the katana that Killer B gave him in its sheath on his back with the sling to keep it there around his chest. 1. Soon enough Jiraiya and Naruto could see the large gateway for Kanoa in the distance, once Jiraiya saw the gateway he stopped and turned to Naruto. Okay brat this is where we part ways for now, said Jiraiya. What do you mean Ero Senen? Aren't you coming with me into Kanoa and explain everything to Gigi? Asked Naruto. A tick mark appeared on Jiraiya's head at being called the nickname as he hated being called that and he couldn't get Naruto to call him something else, plus it didn't help with the fact that Sunid encouraged and praised him every time he called Jiraiya that. Quickly deciding to ignore Naruto's nickname of him, Jiraiya decided to explain why he wasn't going to Kanoa with him. Sorry brat, but I have somewhere I need to go first, but once I have that done I will come back here, answered Jiraiya. At this Naruto raised his left eyebrow as he didn't believe Jiraiya. Does this little side trip involve you going to some hot spring to look at naked girls, because if it is Ero Senen not only will I tell Ka-chan about you leaving me to go off peeping. But I will also administer my own formal payback on you, said Naruto with an evil look and smirk on his face that he had inherited from his mother, which never ceased to freak Jiraiya out at how much Naruto was like his mother. But what got Jiraiya really worried was Naruto mentioning that he would administer his own punishment, as Naruto was vicious when he was punishing someone. Hey, hey, hey now Naruto there no need to for that as I'm on the up and up on this, don't you believe me? Nope, deadpanned Naruto, which caused Jiraiya to fall on the ground after hearing Naruto's reply and muttered about disrespectful brats these days. Well I'm serious this time, I'm meeting a contact of mine who sent word to me yesterday that he had information for me and I have to meet somewhere. But once I have that done I will come back here, okay, said Jiraiya. For a moment Naruto said nothing, but then sighed and then spoke, fine then, Dot, but I promise you Ero Senen, if this is one of your research missions for one of your books. I will make sure that you pay for skipping out on me again and it will be worse off than that time at Crater City and I will reveal you, little secret, to everyone in the village. At this Jiraiya audibly gulped at the threat as what happened there was second time he came close to being killed, the first being when he peeked in on Sunid when they were younger and Naruto also had something over Jiraiya that he didn't want anyone in the world to know. Flashback one year ago. Jiraiya was currently hiding in the leaves of a tree nearby the local hot spring and looking through his telescope at the different young girls who were relaxing in the hot spring. As he was looking through the telescope a new young girl with raven-like hair and bright green eyes who looked to be about in her mid-twenties had just entered the hot spring area, and was about to take off her towel and enter the hot water with the other young girls. Ooh why 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 ee 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 ee, that's it baby take it off. This is gold, you are so to be in my next book, said Jiraiya out loud as he leaned forward to get a better look at her. But just as the girl was about to take off her towel, a voice suddenly cried out. Hey Ero Seninin, get down here and stop peeking on those girls I need your help with this jutsu you showed me. Naruto's sudden shout had caught Jiraiya by surprise where he lost his balance and fell forward and landed flat on his face on the ground. 
www. Damn you brat what is it can't you see I'm busy, said Jiraiya as her picked himself up. I told you I need your help with this jutsu as I still can't get it, said the 11 year old Naruto as he crossed his arms and looked down at the toad sage who was still on the ground. I already told it to you how to do it, said Jiraiya as he lifted himself up. No you didn't, all you did was show me the jutsu once and just told me the bare basics of it and the left to go peeking on those girls in the hot spring, I need to know more and I don't know what I'm doing wrong, said Naruto with a frown. Listen brat I can't be holding your hand all the time you eventually have to learn to do things by yourself without someone always watching over you, besides I not peeking I doing research for my next book, replied Jiraiya. It the same thing no matter how you say it and to be honest I don't know why you even write those trashy books, replied Naruto. They're not trashy they are a work of art, cried Jirai with annoyance, where he then took out one of Hayes' books from his pouch and held it up like some kind of holy book. They're trash, repeated Naruto, even Ka-chan and Shizunoni-chan say so and they even said that no one really reads them. Hey, that not true. I have you know I have hundreds of loyal fan who eagerly look forward to each of my books, spoke Jiraiya with pride. Huh, more like hundreds of pathetic men, that can't find themselves girlfriends and need to read your trashy books to escape reality, scoffed Naruto. Ha, huh, like a brat like you would know anything about finding himself a girlfriend, scoffed Jiraiya back. I know a lot more than you, as at least I don't end up being attacked and beating up by a mob of angry women every mouth for peeking on them like you. Besides I can sure as hell say that I won't stay a virgin until I'm 40 unlike some people I know, replied Naruto with a smirk, which got bigger when he saw the shock look on Jiraiya's face, which turned to horror. WHO told you that? cried the panicked Jiraiya, as Naruto had just uttered Jiraiya, deepest darkest secret that no one should know. You did when you got drunk after drinking too much sake at my 10th birthday, Luckily for you Shizunoni-chan wasn't in the room at the time and Ka-chan was asleep, answered a smirking Naruto. Although I'm sure Ka-chan will love to know that little bit of information, I think I go find her now and tell her as punishment for not helping me train and going off peeking. No you will not, cried the panicked Jiraiya, as he chased after Naruto, as he couldn't let Naruto tell his mother. Since if soon it found out, she would never let him hear the end of it and would tease, torture and hold it over him for the rest of his life and probably the afterlife as well. For the next 10 minutes Jiraiya chased after Naruto through the forestry behind the hot spring, after which Naruto came to the edge of the forestry with Jiraiya hot on his tail. When he reached the forestry edge he saw the large group of girls that Jiraiya had been spying on a few minutes ago coming out of the entrance of the hot spring fully clothed. Upon seeing them Naruto quickly came up with a cunning and evil plan that would have made a certain snake senin proud. Quickly Naruto got some water from his water bottle and spread some on his eyes to make it look as if he was crying. After which upon hearing Jiraiya nearing where he was Naruto quickly ran out to the girls coming out of the hot spring, started to put out the waterworks with fake tears and cries. Wa 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 cried Naruto as he ran up to a young blonde hair girl who quickly bended down to Naruto to comfort him, while the other girls surrounded him to see why he was so upset. There, 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 are you okay sweetie what wrong? Asked the blonde girl. Hip, 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 sputtered Naruto as if he really was crying. There a big tall old white hair man chancing after me. Hip, hip. He offered me sweeties to eat and brought me to into the forest and made me read some weird book with him that had pictures of naked men and ladies doing funny things with each other. Hip, hip. He also started to touch me in places I didn't like, which was why I ran away and he still after me, said Naruto in a scared innocent voice to make him sound all the more convincing. Upon hearing this, the women became filled with feminine rage and angry, where they were about ready to go and hunt down this man and make him suffer for trying to corrupt the innocent boy. And as if answering their praise, Jiraiya appeared from out of the bushes looking for Naruto, there you are. He said and was about to go over to him, but the group of women quickly put themselves in front of Naruto. We won't let yet touch a hair on this little boy and try and corrupt him you fitly pervert, said the young raven-haired girl that Jiraiya had been spying on earlier. Hey, hey, hey. Dot now girls I don't know what the kid there has told you there, but don't believe whatever he told you as it isn't true. I can assure you, said Jiraiya.
The girls might have been willing to hear Jiraiya out had he not been still holding the Ika Ika book in his hand, which furthered to infuriate the girls and solidify Naruto's story, it also helped that Naruto kept his innocent look on so that the girls would side with him. And if Jiraiya wasn't in enough trouble, then Naruto put the final nail in his coffin for him, that him, he pointed at Jiraiya accusingly, he's the one who tried to make me read those books that he said he wrote, and I also saw him peeping on you in the hot spring when you were bathing. Upon hearing all this flames or righteous female rage and anger filled the women's eyes and Jiraiya then knew he was a dead man as there was no way he could talk himself out of this situation. When he realized this, he could also see from behind the group of girls, Naruto was smiling evilly at what he had just done, and waved goodbye to Jiraiya, knowing what would happen next. Damn you Naruto! Cursed Jiraiya inside his mind, although a small part of himself could not help but admire Naruto for being able to manipulate the girl so well into doing his bidding. Quickly pushing that thought aside Jiraiya then did the only thing he could do and what any man in his situation would do, he ran, where he was quickly followed by the large group of girls ready to lay a beat down on the super pervert. After a while many people around the city could hear the girly screams of pain and cries agony coming for Jiraiya. Flashback ends. Jiraiya could not help but wince at the memory of the pain that he felt after the beating that he went through from the girls, as there wasn't a part of his body that wasn't in pain after it. After a few hours he had somehow managed to get back to where Sunid, Naruto and Shizun were staying so that he could be treated for his injuries. Unfortunately, instead of receiving care from Sunid, he received another beating at the hands of and wrathful Sunid and Shizun. As they had heard from some of girls who had been among the group that had beat Jiraiya, who had come to them to heal some bruised fists. That a tall white-haired man who was the author of the Ika Ika books was trying to corrupt a young blonde hair boy by making red his books. Needless to say that when Sunid and Shizun heard this, they were less than pleased, when Jiraiya tried to explain that it wasn't true and that Naruto was lying. Naruto just played the innocent act perfectly, as he had both Sunid and Shizun wrapped around his fingers, where they would believe anything he said to them. Hence both Shizun and Sunid decided to teach Jiraiya a lesson about trying to corrupt Naruto. Jiraiya could not help but shudder as he remembered the vicious beating that he received at the hands of Sunid, which was only matched by the one when he peeked on her when they were young. He also could not help but rub his rear end as he remembered how Shizun turned his rear into a pincushion and shudder again at how close she came to turning his manhood into one as well. After the beating Jiraiya was in for several months of long agonizing recovery and any thought of payback on Naruto was quickly pushed aside. When Naruto came to Jiraiya and told him when he was in his cast that he was put in after the beating, if he tried any kind of payback or tried to skip out on his training again to go out peeking. Then he would prank Jiraiya back with equal force if not worse and he even threatened to tell Sunid his little secret as well. Jiraiya of course agreed to this, and ever since then Naruto has had Jiraiya in his back pocket. Honestly brat this is on the up and up, I be back in about two days time tops, but I don't want you to tell Sarutobi sensei about your powers or what you can do. I also don't want you to tell or show anyone them, at least not until you become an official genin and are fully integrated into your team by which time I should be back to explain everything to the old man, as it's probably best that I explain everything to him, said Jiraiya. Naruto just nodded, where they then separated, where Jiraiya went off to meet his contact and Naruto continued on to the village. Soon after separating from Jiraiya, Naruto reached the main gate, where he quickly showed a side permission slip, that Sarutobi sent him a few months ago so that he could enter the village without trouble. After entering it Naruto headed to the Hokage residence to see Sarutobi, as he headed there he looked around the village and saw all the different buildings and things in it, including the several ninjas walking in the streets with the civilian and even leaping on the rooftops. Not wanting to draw attention to himself, Naruto decided to walk on the street and take in the scenery. As he looked around he saw the Hokage monument in front of him, with the heads of his great-grandfather, the Shodaim Hokage, his great, granduncle the Nadaim Hokage, his mother's teacher and his surrogate grandfather the Sandaim Hokage and his father the Yondaim Hokage. As Naruto looked at the faces carved into the mountain, he knew he had a lot to live up to and both his parents and his ancestors left a long casting shadow over him. That he would need to overcome if he wished to be acknowledged, not as the son of the Yondaim Hokage and Sunid of the Senan. Nor as the descendant of the founders of Kanoa and of the Shodaim and Nadaim Hokages, but as himself, where he wished to stand up on his own two feet and prove himself worthy of standing on equally footing with them and become Hokage. 
Naruto had dreamed of one day becoming Hokage ever since he was five and learned about his ancestors, he became even more determined to become Hokage soon after he learned that the Yondime was his father. But not only that he also wanted to surpass them all as he believed that it was the only real way that he would truly step out of the rest of his family shadow and for people to truly acknowledge as himself and not as the child or descendant of other great and famous shinobis. Soon enough Naruto reached the Hokage residence and entered it and went over the stairs that led to the Hokage's office. When he got there he saw the Hokage's secretary to his right, who was at her desk writing up something, when she looked up she saw Naruto to see what he wanted. Can I help you young man? She asked. A, hey, yes, I would like to see the Hokage please, replied Naruto. I sorry, but the Hokage is a very busy man and you have to make an appointment to see him, said the secretary politely. Well the Hokage will be expecting me, as he knows I'm arriving here as I'm not from this village, spoke Naruto although the secretary did not look convinced as to what he is saying. Look, could you just go into him and say that Naruto is here, he will know who I am and if he doesn't then I leave, okay, said Naruto. As he didn't want to waste any time on trying to convince the women to let him see his surrogate grandfather for the first time, plus he didn't want to cause a scene in here which was why he didn't tell her his full name. Very well then, said the secretary with a sigh, as she believed she was wasting her time asking the Hockage as often enough young children came here wanting to talk to the Hockage. But when she entered the Hockage office and told him that a young blonde-haired boy carrying a katana on his back named Naruto was outside his office wanted to speak to him and saying that he was expecting him. The secretary was surprised to see an eager and happy look appear on the old Hockage's face, where he quickly called his anbu that were hidden in his room rafters and told them to leave. After which he then told her to tell the Anbu that were outside his room to leave as well and told her that she was dismissed for the rest of the day and she was to tell Naruto to come in. After the secretary and the Anbu left the Hokage's office Naruto entered it, where Sarutobi quickly went over to Naruto and went and gave his surrogate grandson a long overdue grandfatherly hug which Naruto was more than happy to return. Naruto my boy it's a good to finally see you, look at you. You've gotten so big, spoke the Sandime as he looked Naruto over. It seems like only yesterday when I last saw you, where you were just in diapers, he said, which caused Naruto to smile a little. As Haruzen looked over his surrogate grandson, he could not help but be amazed at how he looked so much like his father despite the small differences he got from his mother like her skin color and eye shape. You look so much like your F.A., spoke Haruzen but quickly stopped himself from saying father. Like who, my father, said Naruto with a smirk, shocking the old cage. Why why you know about H him, said the surprised cage to which Naruto just nodded, did your mother or Jiraiya tell you? He asked to which Naruto shook his head. Nope I figured it out myself, replied Naruto surprising the old cage further. You figured it out yourself, repeated the old Hokage in shock, where Naruto just nodded again, H H how? That's a long story that I can explain if you would sit down first, replied Naruto to which both he and Sarutobi sat down on the two seats in front of the Hokage's desk. Naruto then went on to explain how he discovered about the Yondime being his father and finding out about how his had sealed the QB in him, which of course surprised Sarutobi at first but then started to chuckle at how Naruto was defiantly his parents' son. Naruto also then went on to tell how he had been doing over the years and what he had been up to, although he made it a point to leave out what his mother, Jiraiya and Shizune had trained him in as Jiraiya had told him. When Sarutobi asked him what they had trained him in Naruto had told him that, Jiraiya would explain when he got here in a few days time from meeting his contact. Since Jiraiya had told him not to tell or reveal to anyone until he was fully a Kanoa ninja and was on a team, which Sarutobi nodded in understanding and accepted to wait for Jiraiya to arrive and inform him. Naruto also told Sarutobi why his mother and Shizune weren't with him, since Sarutobi had wondered why they hadn't come with him. After explaining all this Naruto and Sarutobi spent the next few hours talking and catching up with one another, when Naruto told him many different stories about the different things he did including the different pranks he would play on Jiraiya which made the old Hokage laugh in her amusement, Naruto even told Sarutobi how he had befriended both Shin and Rurichio, fire daimyo's granddaughter, and how he had saved them both too. Sarutobi had of course heard about both incidents as he had heard from one of Sunid's letters that Naruto had saved the high priestess daughter Shin from a group of Amnins. While he had heard about Naruto saving the fire daimyo's granddaughter from a wild bear from the daimyo himself, 
Both incidents made the old cage very proud of the his surrogate grandson proving for certain that he was his father's son. As just like with Minato Naruto put himself in harm's way so to help save and protect others, he also could not help but chuckle to himself, as he had also heard that both girls had also been quite taken with him. Which will no doubt, cause Naruto much trouble and his mother many headaches in the near future if he continued with saving and attracting princess and other girls. After a while the two stopped talking where, Sarutobi got off his seat and went over to behind his desk, and they came back and handed Naruto a set of keys and a note and told him that they were the keys to his apartment where he would be staying and where it was. As the old Senju clan compound had been destroyed during the QB attack and Naruto couldn't stay in his father's home yet as it would draw too much unwanted attention to him. Naruto of course understood this and nodded his head in understanding, after which Sarutobi then spoke. Now Naruto, the class graduation exam will begin tomorrow at 9.30 and I have already explained to the teacher a chunin named Aruka to expect you, although all he knows is that you're a new student who is going to take the exam who was trained elsewhere. He doesn't know who you really are as I didn't want any leaks that you were arriving here, but that note will tell him who you really are, okay. Explained the sandime to which Naruto just nodded. Also you should know that tomorrow morning, I will reveal your existence and your arrival to the council tomorrow morning and then to the rest of Kanoa later on in the evening. Since as soon as the students learn who you really are, they will then tell their parents who in turn will tell everyone else. But your father's identity must be kept secret, since as you know if people learn your entire lineage then it was cause endless amount of trouble for you both inside and outside of Kanoa. But even still keeping out who your father is, there are still many who will try and use you for their own means when they learn that soon it is your mother and that you're the heir to the Senju clan, explained Sarutobi further to which Naruto nodded. I understand Gigi, as Ka-chan and Ero Senen explained it all to me before I came here so I'm more than ready to handle them, answered Naruto. To which Sarutobi nodded and smiled at being called grandfather and at Jirai's nickname since it fitted him perfectly. Just as Naruto was about to leave the double door flung open and a small brown-haired boy who looked to be about eight and wore a long scarf around him burst in holding a wooden kunai in his hand. Prepare to be defeated old man, cried the boy as he charged forward with his wooden kunai only to trip over his scarf and fall flat on his face, causing both Naruto and the Sandime to have large sweat drops on the back of their heads. Embarrassed the boy picked himself up and then quickly pointed his finger at Naruto accusingly. You tripped me, accused the boy. I did not, you tripped over your scarf, replied an annoyed Naruto as the boy was starting to annoy him. Yes you did, cried the boy, you ruined my super cool entrance. Huh, dot not much of an entrance if you ask me, with you being so clumsy and falling flat on your face, replied Naruto, simply which caused the boy to loss his cool and charged at Naruto with his wooden kunai. Naruto quickly sidestepped the boy's attack and grabbed his hand with the wooden kunai and slapped it out of his hand and then bonked the boy on the head causing him to fall on the floor on his rear and hold his head in pain. Hey, you can't don't that to me, cried the boy as he held his swore head and looked up at Naruto. Can't I, said Naruto with a raised eyebrow. Yay, as I'm the grandson of the Hokage, said the boy angrily, where he thought that upon hearing this Naruto would go on his knees and beg forgiveness. Unfortunately for him, Naruto wasn't intimated by this news a bit, where he just grabbed the kid by the collar and lifted him up so that he was eye level with Naruto. Upon doing this another voice shouted out, let his honorable grandson go immediately you ruffian, where a tall man wearing dark sunglasses and a dark shinobi uniform entered the office. Yay let me go or you will be in big trouble, said the boy as he struggled to get out of Naruto gripe, but could not. At which point Naruto just brought the boy right up into his face and looked directly into his eyes, listen brat, I couldn't care less if you were the Hokage's grandmother, because if you think that's going to scare me then you got another thing coming. Besides if you want to talk about social rank, then I outrank you, as my great-grandfather and my great-granduncle were the ones who built this village. Not mention both of them were Hokage's as well, so there. Said Naruto. Naturally both the boy and the man, who had entered the office, had been stunned and confused when they heard this, while Sarutobi just sighed and rubbed his head feeling a headache coming on, where he then decided to do some damage control before things began to go further out of control. Naruto could you please let go of my grandson, please, he didn't mean anything by it, pleaded the old cage and sighed as his grandson was always getting into some kind of trouble. 
Naruto of course let him go, where the boy landed on his rear hard, after which he then picked himself up, while still ribbing his sore bum. Now before things escalate further I believe some introductions are needed, spoke Sarutobi, Naruto. Allow me to introduce you to my grandson Konohamaru and his private tutor Ebisu. After which Sarutobi then turned to Konohamaru, Ebisu, Konohamaru, Ebisu allow me to introduce you to Senju Naruto. My former student Sunid's son and as he said, the great-grandson of the Shodaim Hokage and the great-grand-nephew of the Nadaim Hokage as well as sole heir to the Senju clan, spoke Sarutobi completely shocking Konohamaru and completing stunning Ebisu. After a minute or so Ebisu regained himself, where he quickly bowed respectfully to Naruto, it is an honor to meet you Senju-sama, please forgive my rudeness a moment ago as I had not known who you were, he spoke as he had no idea whatsoever that Naruto was the heir to the founders of Kanoa and heir to the noblest clan in all of Kanoa if not the shinobi world, let alone the fact that Sunid had a child. Forget it, call me Naruto and don't bow as I hate people bowing to me, replied Naruto. Yes of course, thank you Naruto-sama, replied Ebisu, where he bowed again, much to Naruto's annoyance as he hated when people called him by those stuffy titles and bowed to him, as all he wanted was to be treated like a regular person. Hey Gigi, spoke Naruto surprising both Konohamaru and Ebisu at how he addressed the Hokage. I'm going to take a walk around the village and get my bearings here, so I can at least enjoy being a normal person for the remainder of the day before half the entire village starts to treat me like the son of Kami or something like it, said Naruto. Very well Naruto, I see you tomorrow, replied the old cage where he then turned to talk to Konohamaru and Ebisu. Several hours later, for the past few hours Naruto spent his time walking around the village and getting his bearings, during his walk around the village he saw things like the Kanoa Hospital, the Kanoa Hot Springs, the Kanoa Library, the Memorial Stone, the Ninja Academy and the different training grounds. After he had fully looked around the village, Naruto decided to get something to eat, but just when he was about to go find a restaurant he suddenly heard some arguing around the corner. Come on why won't you go out with me, plenty of other girls would love the chance to go out with me, said a young man's voice. Then why don't you go ask one of them, since I have already told you about a dozen different times. I, am not interested in you. Besides I heard plenty of things from girls you already dated and I have no interest in being one of your conquests for you to talk about to your friends, Guzan answered a young girl's voice. Upon hearing this Naruto peeked around the corner to see what was going on when he did he saw three tall medium built boys, who were blocking the way of a medium tall brown haired girl, who was carrying a brown paper bag full of groceries in her arms. The boy in the middle, who was clearly the leader of the three, then grabbed hold of the girl's arm and pulled it slightly causing her to drop the bag and spill the groceries onto the ground. Now listen to me, you will do as I say and you will like it, because if you don't, I can get my father to make things very difficult for you and your old man and that run down of stand of yours, spoke the leader. Let go of me, cried the girl as she tired to get out of the grip of the leader, but could not as it was too strong. Having seen enough Naruto decided to intervene and stop this, since if there was one thing that Naruto hated was bullies, especially those that gang up on a helpless girl. She said let go, so I suggest that you do it, spoke Naruto as he came out from the corner. Beat it kid this doesn't concern you, spoke the leader as he just gave Naruto a passing glance before turning his attention back on the girl. I'm afraid it does, as if there is one thing I can't stand it's seeing a bunch of thugs, ganging up on a helpless girl and forcing her to do something against her will by threatening her and her family, said Naruto. You got a big mouth kid and if you know what good for you, you will shut it and leave while you still can, said the leader as he glared at Naruto. Sorry can't do that, replied Naruto as he took off his sling and sword and held it in his right hand. Upon seeing Naruto taking his sword off his back, the leader and the two others started to laugh, ha, 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 you actually think you can take on all three of us by yourself, said the leader. I don't think I can, I know I can, now let go of the girl and you and your boyfriends won't have to limp your way to the hospital, said Naruto. The leader just sneered at Naruto's threat, believing that Naruto was no threat to him and was just some punk kid trying to act the hero. You got guts kid I give you that, dot but not a lot of brains and guts can only get you so far. Where they usually result in you getting into situations that are over your head, just like now, said the leader where he then turned to the two boys next to him, dot get him. The two boys quickly went over, where the first one to the left went over and try and grab Naruto by the collar. 
but just as the boy stretched out his hand to grab Naruto, Naruto quickly grabbed onto the boy's wrist with his free left hand, and twisted it causing the boy to fall onto the ground onto his knees and cry out in pain, Has Naruto was a small twist away from breaking his wrist from the wrist lock. Upon seeing what had happened to the first boy, the second boy quickly raised his fist to hit Naruto and help his friend. Seeing the second boy, Naruto let go of the first boy's wrist and ducked under the second boy's fist and the hit the boy right in the stomach with the end of his sheathed katana, causing the boy to double over in pain as he held his stomach. Naruto the quickly raised his sheathed katana up and smacked right into the bottom of the boy's chin, causing the boy's head to be smacked backwards and break several of the boy's lower teeth. The boy then fell backwards, where he held his bleeding mouth in pain and cried muffled screams of pain with his hand covering his mouth. As this was happening, the first boy quickly got up off the ground and went to try and hit Naruto when his back was turned, but unfortunately for him, Naruto saw him and he quickly twirled around to avoid the hit. He then hit the first boy at the back of his head with his sheathed katana, where thanks to his momentum from charging forward combined with the hit to the back of his head, the boy fell forward onto the ground. The boy then tried to turn around and get up, but just as he tried to turn his head Naruto kicked him right the face breaking the boy's nose. The boy stayed on the ground as he held his now broken nose, unable to concern himself with anything else other than his now broken nose. After seeing his friends being handled by Naruto, the leader of the three started to get nervous, but he quickly pushed that aside, as he wasn't going to let some kid intimated him. After which he let go of the girl and quickly charged forward at Naruto, who just sighed when he saw the leader of the three charging at him like a fool and just muttered Barker. Naruto then let the boy come right up to him, where he then sidestepped the leader, when he tried to punch Naruto, after which Naruto then stuck out his leg causing the leader to trip over it and fall onto the ground. As the leader tired to pick himself up, Naruto kicked him in the side causing him to fall onto his back, where the leader then tired to pick himself up again, but when he did he felt a foot stand on his groin causing the boy to howl in pain after which he then found the tip of a katana blade right above his neck. When he looked up his sore annoyed Naruto looking down, gathering what courage he had left and sneered up at Naruto. Do you have any idea who I am? I'm Furyoku Guzen, son of Furyoku Kagato, who is one of the wealthiest and most influential men in all of Kanoa, and is a member of the Council of Kanoa and the moment he hears about this he will make you pay dearly for what you did to me. Unfortunately for Guzen, Naruto wasn't the less bit intimated by Guzen's threat and just lowered his sword a bit more down at the boy's throat and cutting the skin slightly and making it bleed. When Guzen felt the blade at his neck and causing it to bleed slightly he started to get scared and began to believe that Naruto was going to kill him. WWWH what a why why yo you doing, said Guzen panic like, WWH weren't you ll least listening to me. I heard you quite clearly, dot and I don't care, even if you were the son of Kami himself I still would not care, replied Naruto, as he glared down at the now scared older boy. W W wait d don't d d do it, I g g give you a a and anything why you want, money, jewels, gold. I e even d do anything why you want me to do, just please don't kill me, begged the boy. Becoming disgusted with the cowardly older boy, Naruto then spoke, fine then. Here's what I want you to do. From now on, you're never to bother or even come near this girl ever again. Because if you do I will take away what makes you a man, despite how small it is, said Naruto as he lowered his katana between the boy's leg, making him even more nervous. Quote comma dot dot. And the same goes if I ever hear that you trying to force yourself on another girl again, am I clear, said Naruto and then finished with a small killing intent, which caused a large wet spot started to form between his legs. Not trusting his voice to speak, the boy just nodded, where Naruto then removed his katana from between the boy legs and stepped away, he then told him to help his friends and to get out of his sight. The boy quickly helped the other two boys up and they then all ran off with their tails between their legs. Once the three older boys were gone Naruto put his katana back in his sheath and then slung it back on his back, after which he then turned around to the brown haired girl he rescued from the boys. Are you okay miss? He asked. Yes, I fine thank you, replied the girl, where she the started to pick up the groceries that fell to the ground after Guzan had grabbed her. Here let me help you, said Naruto as knelt down to help the girl with her groceries. Thanks again, eh, said the girl slightly embarrassed, as she did not know her savior's name. Naruto, he replied. 
Then thank you Naruto, and by the way my name is Ayami, said the girl named Ayami. It is nice to meet you Ayami, said Naruto as he held out his hand and shook her hand when she held it. I don't mean to sound ungrateful because I, am, but you should not have done that, as Guzan will tell his father and can cause a lot of trouble for you, said Ayami. Don't worry about me I can handle you the likes of them, said Naruto to which Ayami just smiled. Once all the groceries had been all picked up they headed back to Ayami's father stand, as Naruto had insisted on carrying the groceries for her and escort back, in case Guzan and his goons tried something else on her way back to her father's stand. Soon enough they arrived at the stand, where Naruto saw that it was a ramen stand, your stand is a ramen stand. Asked Naruto, to which Ayami just nodded. After which Naruto almost yelled out in excitement as ramen was his favorite meal in the world. When they went into the stand Naruto saw a middle-aged man in the stand making some noodles with his hands, when he turned around he saw Naruto and Ayami entering the stand. Ah good Ayami you're here, I was beginning to get worried as I expected you back 15 minutes ago, said the man who was clearly Ayami's father. Sorry to San, but as I was on my way back here from the store I met Guzan and his goons, replied Ayami with a frown. To which her father had his own frown as he knew all about Guzan and his attempts to woo his daughter and make her yet another one of his conquests, but thankfully Ayami was too smart for his smooth talking where she politely told him each time he tried that she wasn't interested in him, although it had not stopped him from keep trying. Ayami's father had been on more than one occasion been tempted to punch the spoiled punk as he continued to harass his daughter, but each time Ayami had calm him down telling him doing so would only cause him trouble from Guzan father. Was he harassing you again? Asked Ayami's father, to which she nodded and told him how this time Guzan had threatened to ruin their stand if she didn't do what he wanted her to. When Tenchi, Ayami's father, heard this, he was furious and was about to go out and hunt down Guzan and wring his neck. Fortunately for Guzan, Ayami was able to stop her father and tell him how Naruto came and helped her and how he handled Guzan and his goons. After hearing this Tenchi, smiled in satisfaction and thanked Naruto for helping his daughter and as a reward he offered Naruto a free meal at the stand, which Naruto quickly agreed, as he was hungry. For a while Naruto talked to Ayami and her father as they made the ramen and told him how he was new here and was entering the ninja academy for the final exams. Since he had been training outside the village with his family and was given special permission by the Hokage to do the exam and skip the academy years. This of course impressed both Ayami and Tenchi, as they knew that for Naruto to be allowed to skip the academy years and to simply do the final exams to become a full Kanoa Shinobi he would have to be quite skilled. Although Ayami already had a fair idea considering how easily Naruto had handled Guzan and his goons. After a little while Ayami handed Naruto a large bowl of hot ramen and told him to enjoy it, which he did for the moment that the hot noodles were in his mouth Naruto had stars in his eyes as this was the best ramen he had ever tasted. Within seconds Naruto quickly ate everything in the bowl. That was great Ayami-chan, said Naruto, which made the girl smile. Thanks, my two san thought me everything I know about cooking, she replied. Is there any more? Asked Naruto as he was still hungry and was hoping to have more of Ayami's delicious ramen. Sure as much as you like, said Ayami with a smile and went to get more ramen from the large pot. As Ayami turned around to get more ramen Naruto started to get a dreamy look in his eyes as he stared at Ayami, a pretty girl who can cook delicious ramen for me whenever I want, I think I'm in love, thought Naruto as he thought about him and Ayami married and her cooking him lots and lots of ramen every day when he came home. 3. After about half an hour and 27 bowls of ramen later, Naruto was finally full. The amount of ramen that Naruto ate naturally shocked Ayami and Tenchi, as the only people that they knew that could eat that much ramen were the Akamaiki clan members and Uzumaki Kushina. Once he was full Naruto thanked Ayami and Tenchi for the free meal and promised to come back again soon, both Ayami and Tenchi said that he was more than welcome too. Although Tenchi did joke that next time Naruto would have to pay, which caused Naruto to smirk a little. After his meal Naruto started to head to his new apartment, which was in a quiet area with not too many people so that Naruto wouldn't be hounded by people once they knew he was Sunid's son and heir to the Senju clan. As Naruto headed home he felt that someone was following him, at first he had thought it was nothing but when he quickly turned around he saw a small figure hiding behind a corner. Deciding to find out who was following him Naruto quickly turned into the next corner that led to an empty street, where he then made a quick shadow clone and had the clone continue down the street. 
while he jumped up to a nearby rooftop and hid himself so that he could see who was following him. Soon enough Naruto saw that the figure that was following was the Sandime's grandson Konohamaru, who from the corner he was hiding behind, was watching the Naruto shadow clone walk slowly down the street. Deciding to find out why the boy was following, Naruto quickly but silently jumped down from the roof and snuck up on the unsuspecting Konohamaru, where he then grabbed the boy by the back of his collar and lifted him up in the air with just one hand. What the hell? cried Konohamaru in surprise, before he then started to cry out and yelling to let him go, but when he saw that it was Naruto who had him a confused look appeared on the on the young Sotobi's face. You, he pointed accusingly, but, but, but how, I was watching you and you were down there, said Konohamaru. As he looked back down at the Naruto shadow clone who had stopped and waved at him with a smile before he puff out of existence. Huh, said Konohamaru in confusion as he still did not understand what had happened. Seeing this Naruto told him that it was just a bunch and I knew you were strong and this proves it, cried the boy, after which he started to say out loud about how he was finally able to find someone strong enough to teach him to beat his grandfather and be finally ride of his lame tutor Ebisu. As he started to say this to himself, a large sweat drop formed on the back of Naruto's head since the jutsu he used was just a clone and although the technique he used was a jonin level 1, it still wasn't a bigger deal as Konohamaru made it out to be. Deciding to find as to why exactly Konohamaru was following, Naruto asked asking why he was following. Okay kid why are you following me and what do you mean by training you? You already have a jonin training you, so you don't need me to train you, said Naruto. Yes I do, as you're the only one that won't treat me like a royal brat and keep calling me honorable grandson as well as all that other stuff, replied Konohamaru. Where he began to explain how people were always treating him like royalty just because he was the grandson of the Hokage, where they never really acknowledged him as himself and were always comparing him to his grandfather. Upon hearing this Naruto was sympathetic towards Konohamaru plight as he knew what it was like to grow up in the shadow of great people where he had a lot to live up. Since his father was the fourth Hokage aka Kanoa no Kiroi Senko, Kanoa Yellow Flash, hero of the Third Great Shinobi World War and savior of Kanoa from the Kyubi. His mother was the legendary slug princess, member of the Densetsu no Sanon and probably the world's greatest medic whose skill helped Kanoa win the Second Great Shinobi World War. While his great-grandfather and great-granduncle were the main founders of Kanoa and the Shodaim and Nadaim Hokages of Kanoa and the teachers of the Sandaim Hokage. Hence like with Konohamaru, Naruto had a lot to live up to as the rest of his family cast a long shadow over him, where he had no doubt that people here would soon start calling him Senju-sama and keep comparing him to his mother and ancestors. Which was why, like with Konohamaru, Naruto wanted to become Hokage so that he would finally stand out from the rest of his family and stand on equal or higher standing they had. After thinking for a few minutes Naruto decided to help Konohamaru out a little, where when he told the boy that he helped train him, Konohamaru then started shout and jump for joy. As Konohamaru did this a devious smirk appeared on Naruto's face, as he thought of something that would make for an excellent prank for both the Sandaim and many other people. Once Naruto had calmed Konohamaru down, he brought him over to a small clearing in the forest near one of the training grounds. Once there Naruto taught Konohamaru a jutsu that he created that would be useful to him and that would allow him to beat his grandfather, although it had taken several hours he eventually got it. Once he did he made Konohamaru swear never to tell anyone who taught him it. Later on in the Sarutobi's home. After a long day of doing paperwork the old Hokage came home to relax and even spend some time with his grandson who lived with him, ever since his eldest son and his daughter-in-law Konohamaru parents died on a mission together. Just when Sarutobi was about to sit down in his armchair in the living room, Konohamaru came running into the room with an excited look on his face. Hey Gigi, I learned a new jutsu that I want to show you, cried the boy as he was eager to try out the jutsu that Naruto had told him could beat his grandfather and nearly any guy in the village. Smiling at his grandson's excitement Sarutobi told Konohamaru to show him his new jutsu. Having his grandfather go ahead, Konohamaru quickly did a hand seal for a hedge and then cried out, Oi rope no jutsu, sexy technique, after which a puff of smoke appeared around Konohamaru. Where once it dissipated, a young attractive brunette woman appeared where Konohamaru was. The woman was naked and had long brown hair that went down her rear, the smoke although did cover certain key parts of her body, Sarutobi could still see her perfect hourglass figure and her attractive face. 
When the old Hockage saw this, a geezer of blood shot out of his nose and blasted him across the room to hit the wall at the other end of the room and passed out from the blood loss, although he did have a perverted grin on his face. When Konohamaru saw this he quickly turned back to normal and started to jump up and down shouting happily that he had finally beat his grandfather. Where he then went over and took the Hockage hat from his unconscious grandfather and ran off happily shouting out that he was the Hockage now, all the while leaving his unconscious grandfather bleeding from the nose with his perverted grin still plastered on his face. 9 o'clock Kanoa Council Room. In the early hours of the next morning the council room in Kanoa was busy with activity as all the clan heads of all of Kanoa's major clans along with several civilian council members, as well as the Anbu commander and the Shinobi elders Homura, Koharu and Danzo. They had all been gathered here in this early hour due to the Sandheim Hockage had summoned them all for a special emergency council meeting. Although the strange thing was that none of them knew what was the emergency that the Hockage had summoned them for, not even the Hockage's advisors, the Shinobi elders. After a little while, once everyone had settled into their seats in the council room, the Sandheim Hockage entered the room and took his high seat in the council room. Good morning to you all and thank you all for coming so quickly for this meeting in this early hour on such short notice as I know it must be an inconvenience for you all, spoke Sarutobi. What is it that was so urgent that you had to speak to us about Hokage Sama, asked Homura. The reason why I have gathered you all here today is to inform you all that yesterday a new gen and hopeful, a young boy in fact, has arrived and will be participating in the academy exam today to become a gen and of our village, answered Sarutobi. Surely you did not call this meeting just to tell us this? Asked Koharu. Actually I did Koharu, replied Sarutobi surprising many at the Hokage calling a meeting for such a trivial matter. Then there must be something different about this boy then, if you called this meeting to tell us about him, spoke Nara Shikaku who was on the verge of falling to sleep during this troublesome meeting. At this Sarutobi smirked, trust a Nara to hit the nail with the hammer. You are quite correct Nara-san as there is indeed something different with this boy, answered the Sandime with a growing smirk, this boy has lived and has been trained outside the village for his whole life. And you have let this boy, who is an outsider to our village in it, and allowed him to try and become a shinobi for our village without even scanning him or interrogating him, spoke Danzo with a raised eyebrow. It seems that you are getting senile in your old age Sarutobi, to let a boy from outside our village, who you say has been trained in the shinobi arts outside our village, and let him try and become a shinobi for our village. For all we know the boy could be a deep cover spy sent into our village to spy on it. Letting the insult about his ability to run the village slide, Sarutobi decided to answer Danzo remark as he was going to enjoy the look on Danzo we he revealed Naruto heritage or at least partly reveal it. The scanning and the interrogation was not needed Danzo as I know who the boy is and his mother who trained him, replied Sarutobi with his smirk growing all the more. And exactly who is this boy Hokage Sama? Asked Yamanaka Anoiki who was starting to get annoyed, as the Hokage had yet to answer the question, as to who was this boy and why he was being allowed to skip the four-year-long training in the academy and go right to the exam. The boy name is Naruto or to be more precise, Senju Naruto, said Sarutobi with a grin, as he saw the utter shocked and stunned looks on all the council members' faces. Nara Shikaku was now wide awake and wide-eyed. Yamanaka Anoiki jaw had dropped and hit the council table. Akamaiki Choza who had been eating some buttered toast had actually stopped eating and dropped it, showing how shocked he was, since to see Akamaiki dropped food was like seeing a hyperactive Nara. Abarame Shibi dark sunglasses actually slide down enough to allow the Sandime to see that the Abarame clan head had dark grey eyes. The civilian council members were gapping like fish out of water. Homura and Koharu were wide-eyed and gapping in disbelief, while Danzo was simply wide-eyed. Inazuka Chum was utterly speechless, which was a first as usually the Inazuka clan head was never quiet for very long and was often the most vocal member of the council, well maybe except for the civilian members when something upset them. Although the Anbu commander mask kept Sarutobi from seeing the Anbu commander shop face his keen shinobi hearing, did allow him to hear a gasp of utter astonishment coming from the Anbu commander. Finally Hyuga Hyashi whose face had a look of being utterly flabbergasted which was the most humorous looking face among the council members, since it was very rare to see the normally neutral and unreadable Hyuga clan head to be so emotional and utterly out of his normal controlled element. Soon enough the council members got out of their shock where there was much shouting and arguing in the room among them was Foyoku Kagato who was the loudest one shouting. That's impossible. 
cried Kagato in utter disbelief, Sunitsama is the only remaining member of the Senju clan, he must be an imposter. I can assure council member Furyoku that Naruto is indeed a Senju in both name and in blood, replied Sarutobi calmly. And how exactly can you be so certain of this Sarutobi, asked Koharu as she found it hard to accept that there was another Senju member other than Sunid alive, without any of them knowing about it. Although still at the same time she knew that her former teammate Sarutobi was no fool and could not be easily tricked, hence he had to have some kind of hard evidence that proved this astonishing claim. That is rather simple Koharu, I was there when he was born, and I know his mother, replied the Sandime. Who was smirking again as he was going to enjoy the looks of shock and disbelief on the council faces once he told them. And who is his mother? Asked Shikaku who had already guessed who it was as it was obvious to him and a few other council members. His mother is my former student, Sunid, replied Sarutobi calmly as if he was discussing the weather with them, while inwardly he was laughing his head to at the faces of the council members as they could not believe what their hockage had just said. As the council were frozen in complete shock, while a certain Nara clan head sighed and muttered silently to himself so that no one could hear him, troublesome hockage. Once the council member got over their shock the council once again was filled with loud voices of arguing and shouts of disbelief. Another civilian council member named Akira Shin who was able shout over the other voices and cry out in disbelief, Tsunade Sama had an child. To which the old Hokage just nodded. Hokage Sama when did this happen, asked the stunned Homura as he still could not get over his head that Sunid actually had a child. As he along with many others thought that the Senju line would die with her, as she never tried to have any children with anyone after the death of her lover Dan. Although it was not because of lack of effort on Koharu and his part, as both of them, along with several other members on the council had tried dozen of times to arrange for her to have children with several different shinobi candidates. That would help her produce strong children who would become powerful shinobis when they grew up. Unfortunately for them, Sunid had stubbornly refused all of them and left the village shortly after with her new apprentice, the niece of her late lover Dan, Shizun and along with her was their hopes of rebuilding the Senju clan. But now with this revelation their hopes were restored, that the Senju clan line continuing to exist. Sunid had Naruto about 12 years ago in this village, as she was brought into it secretly, answered Sarutobi. And why were we not informed of this, when she was giving birth? Asked Danzo with a neutral expression, although inside he was very knee on learning everything he could about Naruto. As he knew that Naruto would be an extremely valuable asset to both him and the village if was trained and used correctly. The reason why no one was told about this was because Sunid wished it to be kept quiet and made me along with her apprentice Shizun and Jiraiya not to tell anyone, replied the old Hokage. And why were we not told? We had a right to know this, said Koharu as she believed that news such as this should have been revealed to them the moment it happened. As she and Homura believed that as members of the council and as former students of Senju Tobarama, the Nadaim Hokage they had a right to know of a new Senju heir being born. As the boy was the best hope of rebuilding the Senju clan, the main founders of Kanoa and was the descendant of both the Shodaim and Nadaim Hokages. Sunid believed that if she told you or other members of the council, you would try and force her to stay here and raise Naruto here, said Sarutobi. And why should he not? The boy is of Senju blood and heir to the Senju clan and he belongs in Kanoa as it was his clan who were the main founders of our village. If the boy had stayed then he could have been protected here and have gotten anything he needed, Sunid took an unnecessary risk in leaving the village with the boy. If the other villagers had learned of his existence and found out that he was living outside the village, then they would have either sent shinobis to kidnap the boy so to rebuild the Senju clan in their villages or they would have sent shinobis to kill the boy and prevent him rebuilding the clan in Kanoa, replied Koharu. Sunid believed that the risk was worth taking, which I agreed with as well at the time, since if Naruto had stayed in the village and the people learned of Naruto's lineage, they would have treated Naruto like royalty and given him everything and denied him nothing, answered Sarutobi. And why should he not be treated as so, the boy is the sole heir to the most noble clan in all of Kanoa, spoke another civilian member named Tanaka Soka. Because if Naruto had been raised here, with all that fame and attention especially at a young age, it would be enough to turn any child's head, where Naruto would grow up spoiled, arrogant and would not value hard work. Since he would believe that just because he is descendant of powerful shinobis he would be handed power on a silver planter. Naruto would also believe that he is better than others because of his heritage and belittle and look down on others, who he believed were not worthy of being around him. 
which many people would help encourage by continuing praising him for being the heir to the Senju clan. Hence this is why I believed it was best that Naruto was raised outside the village where he would be away from all that and would be raised as a normal boy. Who respects others and does not believe he is better than them because of his noble heritage, spoke Sarutobi, who was glad that the plan worked as Naruto had become a perfectly normal and respectful young man just as he had hoped for. After hearing the Sandaim Hokage's reasoning many of the council members such as the clan heads, the Anbu commanders and even most of the Shinobi elders had to agree that what the Sandaim and Sunid had done was indeed the correct decision. As the last thing that they needed was a spoiled and arrogant Shinobi who would most likely embarrass or shame the Senju clan and their village. But still there were some that still did not like the fact that the knowledge of Naruto's existence was kept from them. But Sarutobi the fact remains, that Yu and Sunid took a great risk with the boy's life, where he could have been easily killed or kidnapped by our enemies had they learned of his existence, spoke Koharu. True there was some risk Koharu, but not as great as you claim, as Sunid took every precaution, when keeping Naruto's existence a secret and not to attract attention to them. The fact that Naruto is here, alive, healthy and safe, shows how she was able to do it and raise him to be a happy, healthy and normal boy, said Sarutobi with a hit of pride, as soon it had raised Naruto to become a fine young man showing she had been a good mother to him. Deciding to change the subject a little Shibi decided to ask something that he had been wondering since he learned of Naruto being Sunid's son. Excuse me Hokage Sama, but I have been wondering who is Naruto Sama father. At this question much mutter began with the council as many of them had forgotten that fact and were now curious as to who was Naruto's father. I'm afraid I do not know, lied Sarutobi, as soon it refused to tell me, who was Naruto's father. Although she told me before she gave birth that Naruto's father was dead. Upon hearing this many of the council members were unhappy, but the soon got over it as it was not really important who Naruto's father was. At the same time though Sarutobi was smirking inside his head, as he imaged a look of shock that council members would have if he told them who Naruto's father was. But he quickly pushed that thought aside as he knew that if he did tell the council then it would most likely be leaked to the rest of the village. Where the people would be practically bowing to Naruto on hands and knees wherever he walked, because of his heritage and he would be hounded by an endless amount of families that would try had have Naruto marry one of the daughters, so to improve their social status. Not to mention other villages like Iwa would eventually find out and they would send out countless assassins after Naruto for revenge for what the Yondime did to them and to prevent him from growing up and becoming a threat to them. It seems then that fate must love ironies, spoke Hyashi and gaining everyone's attention, as it seems that there are now only two members each, belonging to the Senju and Uchiha clans. Where the youngest members and heirs of both clans are in now in Kanoa and are now in the same graduation class. While the other members of each clans are living outside the village, where one is a wanted S-class missing nin and the other is living in self-imposed exile. At this much murmuring was heard in the council room, as many had to agree with the Hyashi's statement about it being ironic. As it was very likely that the legendary rivalry of the Senju and Uchiha clans could once again restart with those two boys, in the very village that their ancestors helped build together. Especially if you consider the fact that they are in the same class together and will be on either the same team or on rival teams, where if you also consider their pedigree. As both boys have the same blood as some of the most powerful shinobis that have ever lived running through their veins. Then you can no doubt expect that both their clan's ancient rivalry for one another would remerge again in them. Hokage Sama, spoke the Anbu commander, if I may ask. Do you know what exactly young Naruto Sama is capable of and what his mother has taught him? This question of course got much muttering from the council members as they were all curious to know what the new Senju heir was capable of doing and if he had inherited any of his mother's talents. I'm afraid not, as Naruto would not say, but he has told me that my other former student Jiraiya would be arriving here in a few days time to inform me as he helped to train Naruto, replied the old cage truthfully. Although many on the council were disappointed at not knowing what Naruto was capable of, there was still exciting muttering to be heard in the room. As the fact that Naruto had been trained by not one but two senens, told them that Naruto could be very powerful for his young age. Many even began to mutter that Naruto could be the Senju clan version of Itachi, although without the whole going mad and killing off his clan part. For the next few minutes the council continued to discuss different things about Naruto, but after a while Sarutobi decided to end the meeting as the council knew all that they needed to know for now. 
When the meeting ended, the council members left the council room continued to mutter amongst themselves about Naruto. Many who had sons around Naruto age claimed to try get him to befriend Naruto, while those with daughters planned to try and get the daughters to get close to him in the hopes that they could eventually set up an arranged marriage between the daughters and him. Since sooner or later Naruto would have to marry and have children of his own so to rebuild and continue on the Senju line. 9.30 at Kanoa's Academy. Today was a big day for Chunin Tutor Aruka who was standing in front of 29 young genin hopefuls who had been his students for the past four years. Many of which he was going to miss as he had grown quiet found of them all. As he looked over them he saw several that he knew would pass and become genins and possible great ninjas in time. Students such as Uchiha Sasuke who was the last surviving Uchiha member of the once great Uchiha clan in the village, who had been wiped out by Sasuke's older brother Uchiha Itachi. Another person was Nara Shikamaru who despite his lazy habits, where he would do hardly any work and spend most of his time sleeping, had a brilliant mind and was a tactical genius. Also another noteworldly student was Abarame Shino, who was like all Abarame clan members, who were logical calm thinking shinobis with sound minds and good tactical skills. After a few minutes of reminiscing Aruka believed he had done enough and decided to get things going for the exam, where he then signaled to his assistant Mizuki that it was time to begin the exam. Good morning class, spoke Aruka, where the class responded in like. Now as you know today is the last day that we will be together as a class and I hope you are all ready from your exam now as you know we will, said Aruka, but was then interrupted by a knock on the door. Aruka then turned to the door and told the person to enter where a young spiky blonde haired boy in a green zip up top and green trousers and a sword on his back came in. Excuse me are you Aruka-san, asked the boy, where Aruka just nodded, I was told that you were expecting me, replied the boy. Upon hearing this Aruka suddenly remembered that a few weeks ago the Hokage had told him that a boy from outside village would be attending the academy exam as he had been given special permission by the Hokage to do so. Aruka mentally slapped himself for forgetting this, where he then looked over to the boy and smiled. Yes of course forgive me, I forgot that you would be joining us today, said Aruka. That is okay Aruka-san, I understand. Also I was told by the Gigi to give you this, said Naruto who got a confused look from Aruka and everyone else in the room, excepted for Sasuke, Shino and Shikamaru as they hardly ever show any sign of interest in anything when Naruto said Gigi. And may I ask who is your Gigi? Asked Aruka. The Sandime Hokage of course, said Naruto plainly. That's a lie, cried a long pink haired girl as she stood up and pointed at Naruto accusingly. The Hokage has only one grandson and he is only eight. Naruto turned to the girl and looked at her angrily as he hated be called a liar when he wasn't lying, I'm not lying. Gigi may not be my grandfather by blood, but he is the closest thing to one that I have as he was like a father to my mother, here, this explains everything, said Naruto as he then turned and handed Aruka the note that Sarutobi gave him yesterday. Aruka took the note and spent the next few minutes reading what the Hokage had said on it, when he finished, Aruka's eyes were as wide as sources, where he turned to Naruto who just nodded telling him it was true. Aruka knew it wasn't a fake as he knew the Hokage's writing, but he still had a hard time believing what he had just read and just spent the next two minutes staring at Naruto. This of course greatly annoyed him as he didn't like people staring at him as it felt creepy. Aruka sensei what's wrong, asked an blonde haired girl named Ino, what was in that note, dot and why are you staring at that boy, she continued to ask as she hated being ignored and kept out of some juicy gossip and this look definitely looked like the juicy kind. Aruka quickly got over his shock and then turned to his class although the shock of what he just found out could still be seen on his face. Class we have a new student who will be joining us in the exam, who has been trained outside the village with his family. Hence he has been given special permission by the Hokage himself to be allowed to skip the standard academy training years and go right to the graduation exam to become an official shinobi of Kanoa, spoke Aruka where he would have continued had Kiba not interrupted him. What? cried Kiba, who was angry that this kid, who came out of nowhere was given special permission by the Hokage to skip the four years of training that the rest of them had to do. Even Sasuke was annoyed by this as he was never given that offer and he was the last Uchiha in Kanoa. As I said Kiba, he has been training with his family outside the village and the Hokage feels that he is more than ready to take the academy exam. Due to his training with his family and to put him in the proper training program of the academy would just hinder his growth, replied Aruka calmly. Then who the hell is this guy? 
said Kiba angrily as he pointed at Naruto and glared at him, and what the hell makes him so much more special than us to be allowed to skip the academy training years that the rest of us did, said Kiba and was backed up by his K-9 partner Akamaru who barked in agreement. His name is Naruto, Senju Naruto, replied Aruka shocking everyone in the room including Aruka assistant Mizuki. It is nice to meet you all, spoke Naruto as he bowed respectfully to the class. But Aruka sensei that's impossible. Dot you said that the only remaining member of the Senju clan was Sunid Sama of the Senen, said the long pink haired girl in surprise. Well Sakura I'm afraid that I was misinformed, as Naruto here is indeed a member of the Senju clan as he is Sunid Sama's son, answered Aruka shocking everyone in the room further, as none of them even knew that Sunid of the Senen had a child. For the next few minutes everyone in the room minus Aruka just stared at Naro in a mixture of wonder and awe, which greatly annoyed Naruto. A member of the legendary Senju clan, and the son of one of the Densetsu no Sanon, legendary three ninjas perhaps he might be worth some time and actually be a challenge, unlike the rest of these losers. Thought Sasuke as he eyed Naruto with a calculated look and measured him up, so to see if he was worth his time. Sunid Sama had a son. Orokimaru Sama will want to know this, thought Mizuki. Now Naruto if you please will you sit up at the top next to Hinata over there so that we can begin the exam, said Aruka. Naruto nodded and even smiled at the Chunin tutor as he was glad that Aruka treated him like any other student and didn't call him, Naruto Sama. Although his smile quickly faded when he saw that everyone in the class was staring at him as he went up to his seat to the young Hyuga girl called Hinata. Ohayu Hanata-san it's nice to meet you, said Naruto with a friendly smile and held out his hand in friendship. Hanata of course being very shy and insecure and was very hesitant to say anything to someone from such a famed, renowned and powerful clan, one more renowned, powerful and famous than her own, as well as the son of the strongest Kanoiki in Kanoa if not the entire world. Hence it was only naturally for her to be intimidated by him, as she was afraid of saying or doing something wrong that would make him angry at her and her clan, making her an even greater shame and failure to her father and to her clan. K.K. Konaki her NNN Naru Naruto S.A. Sama, stuttered Hinata nervously. Please call me Naruto as I hate being called Naruto Sama along with the rest of those stuffy titles, replied Naruto with a friendly smile, which of course made the girl blush bright red. At being allowed to call someone of the same if not higher social status as Naruto in such a common title as if they were on equal status or were already well acquainted. HH hi, NAN Naru Naruto S San, stuttered Hinata again, which caused Naruto smile, which in turn made the girl blush brighter red. Before either of them could even speak again, Mizuki came up and handed them both the question sheets for the exam. For the next two and a half hours, Naruto and the other students worked on the exam questionnaire, the questionnaire wasn't all that hard as Naruto had already gone all over this kind of stuff with Shizun and his mother. Once time was up Mizuki came up and collected all the sheets from the students, where Aruka then told them to come outside with them to do the practical parts of the exam, which was something that Naruto was looking forward to. Aruka then told them that they were going to test them on their throwing and aiming, where they would first throw their shurikens at the target pole, after which they were then to throw their shurikens at the three target dummies. For the next hour each of the students took their turns at the target poles and the target dummies. Shino hit 8 out of the 10 target points on the target pole, and got 3 out of 5 target points on the first target dummy, 4 out of 5 on the second dummy and 4 out of 5 again on the third. Kiba hit 6 out of the 10 targets points on the target pole, and got 3 out of 5 target points on the first target dummy, 2 out of 5 on the second dummy and 4 out of 5 on the third. Sakura hit 5 out of the 10 targets points on the target pole, and got 2 out of 5 target points on the first target dummy, 1 out of 5 on the second dummy and 3 out of 5 on the third. Hinata hit 7 out of the 10 targets points on the target pole, and got 4 out of 5 target points on the first target dummy, 3 out of 5 on the second dummy and 4 out of 5 again on the third. Finally the last students remaining were Sasuke and Naruto, Sasuke got all the targets points on the target pole at once, where he threw all 10 of his shurikens at once, where they all hit the targets points on the target pole dead center at roughly the same time. Upon seeing this Sasuke's fan girls started to scream and cheer loudly at how that Sasuke-kun was so cool and talented and that he was the best. Sasuke for his part ignored the girls screaming, while Naruto cringed at the loud screams, after which he shook his head in annoyance, as his mother had told him all about fan girls and how they were the bane of all true kanoikis. 
he could also not help but be disappointed that all the girls in the class, minus Hanata, were fan girls, which went to show how far the Kanoa Academy standards had fallen since his mother's time and it would greatly annoy her when she came to Kanoa and he told her this. Naruto then turned to watch Sasuke as he then threw some more shurikens at the target dummies where he hit all five target points on all three target dummies. This of course resulted in more screams of joy from Sasuke's fan girls, much to Naruto's annoyance. After Sasuke was finished, Aruka then called Naruto up, but as Aruka handed Naruto the ten shurikens he needed to throw for the target pole, Naruto decided to ask Aruka a question. Excuse me Aruka-sensei, but I was wondering would it be okay if we threw something else other than shurikens at the target pole and the target dummies, if we have them. At this question Aruka began to think it over for a moment, well at the target pole you have to throw the shurikens that I gave you, but with the target dummies, I see no problem as long as they are standard shinobi weapons and you have them yourself. Naruto nodded in acceptance as he found it fair, where he then turned to face the target pole and like with Sasuke he threw all ten of his shurikens at once. Where they all hit the target's points on the target pole dead center at roughly the same time, much to the shock and surprise of everyone. After which Naruto the turned to face the target dummies and took out five senbun's needles and five kunais from his pouch, where he held the senbun needles in his left hand and held the kunais in the right hand. And like with the shurikens at the target pole, Naruto threw all five senbun needles and all five kunais at once at the first and second target dummies and hit all five target points on each of the dummies dead center at roughly the same time. He then quickly took out another five shurikens and threw them all at once at the last target dummy, where like with the others they hit all five target points dead center at roughly the same time. Many of the students were greatly surprised by this as they didn't expect anyone other than Sasuke to get a perfect score like that on the throwing exam. After seeing this Aruka was just as surprised, but quickly smiled, it seems that Naruto lives up to his heritage and by judging the look on Sasuke face. It seems that the ancient rivalry of the Senju and Uchiha clan stills lives on in the last of the descendants though Aruka. When he turned and saw Sasuke looking at Naruto keenly with a calculating gaze. Soon after the throwing and aiming test Aruka began the Taijutsu exam, where he started to call out people in pairs and had them fight each other in Taijutsu to see how well their Taijutsu skills were. For the next 40 minutes the students fought each other in taijutsu where someone and others lost, Naruto watched their fights, but most weren't really worth watching, but even still there were a small few that were. Some like Hanata's fight against Sakura, where Sakura attacked Hanata with her knowledge of basic academy level taijutsu and was easily defeated by Hanata, who used her superior gentle fist fighting style to quickly disable and defeat Sakura. Another was Choji against a student named Kota where he used his size and power to defeat Kota. The final one of noteworthy attention was Sasuke against another academy student named Tobio, where Sasuke used his more advanced taijutsu skill and training to completely overwhelm Tobio and defeated him without too much trouble. Finally came Naruto turn, where funny enough his opponent was Kiba. When Naruto heard his name being called out with Kiba's, he took his katana off as he could not wear it on his back during a taijutsu fight even if he wasn't going to use it. He then gave it to Hinata who was standing next to him and asked her to hold it on for him while he fought Kiba. This of course caused the girl to blush bright red again at being trusted to hold on to Naruto katanas while he fought Kiba, where she then stuttered to Naruto that she would. Ha. Yes. I got that Senju guy, now I can show him who is the top dog here, said Kiba as he was confident that he would beat Naruto. Kiba's comment was then followed by several barks from his canine partner Akamaru, who took the barks as encouragement from Akamaru, telling him that he could beat Naruto with no problem. Don't worry boy I going to kick this guy butt so badly that he will wish he had stayed home, said a confident Kiba. As he took Akamaru off his head and put him on the ground, as this was Taijutsu only battle and Akamaru could not help him, not that he believed he needed Akamaru's help. Unfortunately for Kiba if he had listened more carefully to Akamaru instead of listening to what he wanted to hear, he would have heard what Akamaru was really saying, which was Akamaru saying that Kiba should watch out and not underestimate Naruto as he could sense that Nasruto was very strong. Soon enough Kiba and Naruto were on the fighting platform facing one another. I don't care even if you are of the Senju clan and the son of a Senen, you're going down and I going send you crying back to your mammy, spoke Kiba confidently. Big talk, but then again I expect nothing less from the runt of the litter, who
who is all bark and no bite, retorted Naruto, which got Kiva angry at the dog insults to him. When Aruka cried out, Begin, Kiva charged right at Naruto, but before he could even run across halfway through the gap between him and Naruto, Naruto disappeared within a blink of an eye. Before Kiva could fully realize that Naruto was gone, he then felt a massive overwhelming pain coming from his stomach that almost made him throw up his breakfast. When he looked down he saw Naruto kneeling down and elbowing him in the stomach. H H ho how d d di did y u, said Kiba but could not form the words due to the pain, but still Naruto knew what he was trying to say, where he quickly got back up on his feet and looked down at Kiba, who was now keeled over and holding his stomach in pain. How did I do that? You ask, said Naruto with a smirk, simple really when Aruka sensei said begin and you charged at me I saw an opening that just screamed at me to attack, and I just did, stated Naruto as if it was nothing. After which he then left the platform, where Mizuki quickly went onto the platform and went to check over Kiba. At the same time as Naruto was walking off the platform many of the students could not help but stare at him, as many of them could not believe at what they just saw as they all knew that Kiba was no wimp in a taijutsu battle, but yet Naruto had beaten him like he was nothing. Did you see that? Said one student. He just disappeared and beat Kiba with a single hit. Said another student. He's good. Spoke another student. He's spectacular. Said a female student. Well come on what do you expect he's, is, a senju and, is, the, son, of Sunid sama of the Senan, said another female student. Naruto ignored the students' stares and comments, even though he hated them, he knew if he reacted to them it just would encourage them to talk about him more. Although unfortunately had he been paying just a little more attention to them he would have found out that there was now a new fan club being formed out of now many former Sasuke fan girls. Hence the Senju Naruto fan club was now born, spelling trouble for Naruto in the future as well as Hinata, as many of Naruto's new fan girls did not like how friendly Hinata was with their Naruto-kun, and how he would talk to her and how she would blush every time that Naruto talked to her. At the same time Aruka was watching Naruto with nothing short of amazement as he was barely able to follow Naruto movements where he took down Kiba with just one hit, incredible to be so strong at such a young age, but the again I'd expect nothing less from a member of the Senju clan, thought Aruka. So it seems that you're a strong. Though Sasuke as he watched Naruto talk to the shy Hugueras with the same calculating eyes he'd been watching him since he first saw him, you just might be worth fighting and testing myself against Senju Naruto. Soon after the Taijutsu test Aruka told the class that they would have a one hour lunch break and then they would have the Ninjutsu test. When Aruka said this Naruto then turned to Hinata, Hey Hinata would you like to have lunch with me? As I don't know many people here and it would be nice to have some company while having lunch. Why why you aaac actually ww want tt to have lunch w with me? Asked Hinata in nervous surprise as she did not think that Naruto would think that she was worth having lunch with. Yay. Why not? We're friends aren't we? Asked Naruto. FF friends asked Hinata, as she did not have many friends other than her younger sister as most of the other students kept away from her. Thinking that she would not talk to commoners like them as she came from one of the most noble clans in all of Kanoa, not to mention many of the students thought that Hinata was kind of weird as she hardly ever spoke, always stuttered and never looked at people in the face and always looked down when speaking to someone. Yea we are, so come on, said Naruto as he took Hinata's hand, which made the girl turn bright red, where Naruto the led her to a bench nearby. For the next hour or so Naruto and Hinata talked about different things, well technically Naruto talked and Hinata stuttered. Hinata told Naruto about the different things that there were in Kanoa and what happens in it at certain times as well as talked about bits about her clan. Naruto in turn talked about some of the things that he did when he traveled with his mother and Shizune and even told her all about their pet Big Tonton, which Hinata found a little strange but did not comment much about it. As the two talked, they were also being secretly watched by the newly formed Naruto fan club, as they watched Naruto and Hinata many of the girls were jealous of the fact that Hinata got to eat lunch alone with their Naruto-kun. Many of the girls wanted to go over there and break up the two send Hinata off while they spent time with their Naruto-kun. But fortunately for Hinata, and them, the smarter members of the club, as smart as fan girls go, convinced the others not to do so as it would most likely cause, their Naruto-kun, to think badly of them for doing so. Besides spying on him and Hinata and listening to Naruto talk about the different things he did with his mother, allowed them to gain more insight on Naruto, which they could use to get close to him to make him theirs. 
When lunchtime was over Naruto and Hinata headed back to classroom, where the rest of the class would be waiting to do the ninjutsu part of the exam. For the next two hours the students went one by one into a small room in next to the classroom, where Aruka and Mizuki had them do the basic academy ninjutsu. Where if they were able to do all three then they would have official pass the exam and become a genin and if they failed to do all three then they would fail and have to repeat the year. During the course of the two hours the students came in and out of the small room, some came out with headbands on their heads, while others came out with none with disappointed faces. Over time Naruto noticed many different people had succeed becoming genin some like Shikamaru, Choji, Kiba, Shino, Hinata and much to his surprise Ino and Sakura, who from what Naruto saw were probably the biggest fan girls in the whole class. As all they cared about was dieting so to have the bodies looked in, washing their hair, and making themselves look good and gain Sasuke attention, when Naruto saw them with their headbands on their heads. He just shook his head, since it was the final proof he needed to prove how the Shinobi Academy in Kanoa had fallen very low in their standards if they allowed fan girls like those two become ninjas for Kanoa. Eventually Naruto's turn came up, after Sasuke came out of the room with a Kanoa headband on his head, which caused his fangirls to scream and cry out that Sasuke was the greatest. After Naruto's name was called out by Aruka, Naruto got out of his seat to go over to the room, as he did Hinata wished him luck. GG good ill luck nn Naruto-san. Thanks Hinata. Soon enough Naruto entered the room, where he found Aruka and Mizuki sitting behind a small wooden table and facing him. Okay Naruto to pass this test you need to complete all three standard academy jutsus the henge transformation technique, kawarimi no jutsu body replacement technique, and bunshin no jutsu clone technique. Once you have completed that you will have passed and officially become a Kanoa ninja, said Aruka, where nodded just nodded in understanding. Naruto first did a henge where he turned into a perfect copy of Aruka, after which Naruto then did a bunshin no jutsu, where created a perfect copy of himself. After that he dispelled the clone and then did a kawarimi no jutsu with a broomstick that was at the corner of the room behind Aruka and Mizuki. Very good Naruto that was perfect, spoke Aruka with a smile where he the handed Naruto a Kanoa headband, who took it gladly and tied it to his head and walked out the room with a smile. When the class saw Naruto coming out with his headband on his head, the newly formed Naruto fan club started to cry and scream out that they knew he could do it and that he was the best. Naruto just politely nodded his thanks to them and went to sit next to Hinata who slyly smiled at Naruto passing while Naruto grinned back to her. Once everyone was done Aruka and Mizuki came out of the small room and gave out the score where in the exam both Naruto and Sasuke tied with the top score of the exam. But since Sasuke did all four years in academy he would be give the title of the rookie of the year, since the title was given to the student with the highest score which was added by his or her total grade throughout the four years of the academy and the exam. Sakura would be given the title of top kanoiki as she had gotten the highest score on the paper exam and a perfect in the ninjutsu, despite getting an average in the throwing and aiming part of the exam and the taijutsu. Upon hearing this Naruto had to hold back a groin as this once again proven without a shadow of a doubt that Kanoa Academy standards had fallen to an all-time low if fangirls like Sakura were the top Kanoikis. Finally Aruka then announced that Naruto was the dead last of the class due to the only grade they had for him was the grade of the graduation exam. Upon hearing this Naruto shrugged his shoulders as he didn't really care about Academy title like dead last or rookie of the year as they meant nothing to him and they meant nothing in the real world. He was actually glad he got the title as it showed that Aruka was being fair and not treating him special because he was a Senju and Sunid's son. If Aruka had tried to give him the title of Rookie of the Year he would have refused it as he knew he would have only given it to him because of his heritage and not because he had earned it. When Kiba heard that Naruto was the dead last he started to cheer and yell happily. Ha! Cried Kiba he pointed up at Naruto, see, this proves that you're not so hot after all you're the class dope. Kiba, that's enough, said Aruka angrily, as he did not like Kiba was saying, especially since he hated seeing children making fun of others and making a show out of them. The only reason Naruto is the dead last is because we added up your total scores over the four years in the academy. Where we add them up together to make up the grade and since Naruto only joined us today we only have this score to base him on. If he had been with us the full four years in the academy, I have no doubt that Naruto would have tied with Sasuke for Rookie of the Year as his score in the exam was as high as Sasuke's. 
At this remark Kiba just scowled as Aruka had ruined his chance to make a show out of Naruto and pay him back for beating him in their taijutsu spa and humiliating him in front of everyone in the class. That's okay Aruka-san, I don't really care about his remarks as they mean nothing to me as titles like that dead last and rookie of the year mean nothing to me and they mean nothing in the real shinobi world. Besides my mother's teammate and my godfather Jiraiya was the dead last in his class and yet later on he along with my mother and the teammate Orokimaru, became the senen, some of the greatest shinobis in Kanoa and he is also the strongest one among the three of them, replied Naruto. Sasuke muttered a grunt in agreement with Naruto as what he said was true and besides he could care less about being named Rookie of the Year, as it was a meaningless title to him as well. Ha, you're only saying that so to make yourself look like a less of a dope than Europe, retorted Kiba as he wasn't going to let Naruto get away without getting back a little at Naruto, even if they were only cheap remarks. Kiba, cried Aruka as he was about to hold the boy back for dentition if he continued like this even if today was his last day here as a student. He was then about to tell Kiba to sit down and be quiet, but stopped when he saw Naruto hold out his hand telling to let him handle Kiba. Really Kiba, because if I'm the dope, then what does that make you then? Since I did beat you in our taijutsu spa with just one hit, so wouldn't that make you worse than the class dope? Said Naruto with a smirk on his face. Where the whole class then erupted in laughter at Kiba's humiliating as he had walked right into that one, Kiba himself turned beat red in angry and wanted nothing more than to attack Naruto then and there for making him into an even bigger fool in front of the class. But fortunately for him Akamaru, started barking at him, telling him not to or he get into more trouble than he already was in, hence Kiba sat down and fumed at his seat for the remainder of the day. Once class fully ended Aruka and Mizuki bid farewell to the class, where the students all went out to their parents, who were waiting from them, to greet them and congratulate or comfort their children, whether the passed or failed. Naruto accompanied Hinata out of the academy telling her that he would keep her company until her parents came to pick her up. Hinata blushed red from embarrassment and mumbled out that he did not have to as she would be okay by herself, but Naruto insisted as they were friends now, which caused the shy young girl to blush again. As they waited Naruto saw mothers, fathers or both greet their children as they came out, as Naruto watched then he could not help, but think about his mother and his surrogate big sister aunt godmother Shizune. As this was the first real time that he had been away for so long from either of them and although he would not say it out loud he did miss them and wished they were here with him. As he watched the parents and their children being together, he noticed several of the students pointing at him to their parents, no doubt telling them who he was to them where many parents turned to stare at Naruto with looks of shock, amazement and wonder, seeing this Naruto quickly looked away pretending not to notice them, as he did not want to deal with stuff like this right now. Fortunately for Naruto, a distraction arrived to distract him away from the gawking students and their parents. This distraction came in the form of a tall and very attractive looking raven-haired woman, with bright crimson red eyes, who wore a single red sleeve and white patterned bandages with a ninja fishnet shit underneath it. When Naruto saw this woman he had a small blush on his face as the woman was extremely beautiful, where she could easily challenge his mother's beauty when she was young. He also had no doubt that if his godfather Jiraiya was here right now, he would already be writing down her description on his notepad and place her as one of the main characters in his next book. Hello Hinata, I'm sorry to keep you waiting, as I was delayed with some things, spoke the woman in a polite and kind voice, where she then turned to Naruto and smiled showing her crimson-colored lip, which made Naruto blush again, and who is your friend here? Hinata then stuttered out nervously who Naruto was, where the women eyes quickly widened in shock, when Hinata told her who Naruto was. After which Hinata then introduced the women as Yuhi Kuranai and told him that she was her private tutor that her father had assigned to her and was her escort to and from the academy. Naruto politely bowed to Kuranai, telling her that it was a pleasure to meet her, Kuranai of course replied in so and called him, Senju-sama, where Naruto then told her that Naruto would be fine, where Kuranai nodded in understanding and called him so. After seeing the large group of parents now staring at him Naruto decided to take his leave before he drew any more attention to himself by being her. After which he bid goodbye to Hinata and Kuranai and told Hinata he would see her tomorrow for the team placements, which caused a girl to blush a smile a little. After which he then shunshant body flickered away in a whirlwind of leaves, surprising Kuranai and Hinata as well as the rest of the people watching from afar. Since many of them did not expect a genin fresh out of the academy to know the technique. 
later in the evening in front of the Hokage's residence. At near around sunset the people and shinobis of Kanoa were gathered around in the open area in front of the Hokage's residence. They were here because they had all been informed that the Hokage was going to make an important announcement. Soon enough once everyone had arrived, the Hokage came out of his office accompanied by his advisors Danzo, Homura and Koharu and stood up on the balcony and began to speak to the people and shinobis below. People of Kanoa thank you all for coming here this evening on such short notice, cried the Sandime in a low voice so that people below could hear him. Now as you have all been told I have an important announcement to make to you all, although I know that some of you are already aware or have guessed what this announcement is about, but most of you are still unaware, hence I shall tell you now. Yesterday morning a young boy arrived in Kanoa, to become a shinobi for our village, dot now many of you may ask why something like that should matter and cause me to have this gathering. The reason being is because of who this boy is, said the Sandime, which caused much muttering and commotions among the crowd, but it was quickly silenced when the Sandime began to speak again. This boy to whom I speak of is Senju Naruto, son of my former pupil Senju Sunid of the Senan, great-grandson to the Shodaim Hokage, Senju Hashirama the main founder of our village. As well as great, grandnephew of my sensei the Nadaim Hokage, Senju Tobarama and heir to the Senju clan, announced Sarutobi completely shocking and stunning nearly everyone in the village. As no one could have ever guessed that another member of the Senju clan existence and was in fact the son of Sunid the Slug Princess. Before the people could fully get over their shock and would start shouting why they were only being told now and where has Naruto been the past 12 years, the Sandime quickly spoke out again. Now many of you are no doubt wondering why I, am only telling you all now and where Naruto has been the past 12 years. The reason is that upon Naruto's birth, Sunid feared for her son's life, as she feared that her enemies would learn of her son existence and that they would attack him as revenge for her act against them. Hence she kept her pregnancy and her giving birth to a son secret and then went into hiding so that he would be safe, until the time was right for him to come to Kanoa to become a shinobi for Kanoa, spoke old Hokage. Even though the story was not exactly true, it was still believable and everyone accepted it without question as it made sense. Where after hearing the explanation excited chattering erupted in the crowd as it was just revealed to them that soon it had her heir and there was now a heir of the Senju clan where clan could continue on. Soon enough Sarutobi called for silence again, where he then asked for the people and the shinobis to treat Naruto as a normal person as he did not wish for any special treatment and he also asked them to respect Naruto's right to privacy. Although Sarutobi knew that only some would do what he asked, mainly the shinobis and some civilians, many people, mainly civilians and some shinobis, would still go out of their way to treat Naruto like some kind of prince, despite what he said, but it was still worth a short. Once Sarutobi had finished his announcement, he called the gathering to an end and wished the people a good night, where the crowd then began to disperse where many people began to head home. All the while talking amongst themselves what they had just learned. Later on that evening in the forest just outside the Kanoa walls. Just outside the main walls of Kanoa, in the forest Naruto was traveling back into Kanoa, Sarutobi had allowed Naruto to go outside the village to train as he announced Naruto's identity to the people. So that he would not be hounded by the people of Kanoa after they learned who he really was. As he neared the main gate of Kanoa, Naruto sensed that someone was heading right for him, not knowing who it was Naruto decided to hide and see who it was. After a minute or so Naruto saw that the person he sensed was Kiba with a Kamaru following closely behind him, fortunately for Naruto, Kiba had not smelled him with his enhanced smell as he was too preoccupied with heading to his destination. As Kiba went past him Naruto noticed that he was carrying a scroll on his back, Naruto quickly recognized the scroll as the forbidden scroll of Kanoa as his mother had told him all about it when she told him about the history of their clan. Inside the scroll was a list of extremely powerful jutsus, the scroll had been found by his great-grandfather the Shodaim Hokage, Senju Hashirama before he founded Kanoa. The scroll also contained other forbidden ninjutsus that were created by the other Hokages over the years. Naruto knew that if that scroll were ever to fall into the wrong hands or to Kanoa's enemies then Kanoa would surely be destroyed. Also Naruto started to wonder why Kiba had stolen the scroll from the Hokage's residence, since as arrogant and as big of a jerk as Kiba was, he was still no traitor. Hence Naruto realized that there was more to this than it appeared. But before Naruto could even chase after Kiba he sensed another person coming towards him, deciding to see who it was Naruto stayed hidden in the bushes he was in. 
Soon enough Naruto saw the Chun and Aruka go by, who was clearly chasing after Kiba. Deciding to see the events unfold and in case Aruka needed help Naruto followed him. As Kiba traveled toward his rendezvous point he could not help but be pleased with himself at completing a task that neither Sasuke nor Naruto were able to do. He remembered Mizuki coming up to him later on after the academy when he saw Kiba alone. Where he then told him of a special test that only certain students could take, where if the completed they would be given a powerful a rank jutsu as a prize. He told Kiba that both Sasuke and Naruto had tried and failed the test as they were both allowed to try it since they were from powerful clans. Mizuki then told him after seeing how Naruto humiliated Kiba in front of the class, he had called in a favor from a friend to allow him a chance to do the test and prove that he was better than both Sasuke and Naruto. When Kiba heard this he jumped at the chance of showing up not only Naruto but also Sasuke, soon enough Kiba arrived at the clearing where he waited to meet Mizuki as planned. But after a minute or two, someone arrived, but it wasn't Mizuki, it was Aruka and he didn't look pleased with him. Hey Aruka sensei I didn't think I meet you here, said Kiba still thinking that this was all part of the test. Kiba, what the hell do you think you're doing? Do you know what you have just done? Asked Aruka angrily. Of course, replied a smiling Kiba. I passed the test, that neither Sasuke nor Naruto could pass, and it was a piece of cake. Shocked and confused by Kiba's response, Aruka barely noticed and dodged a giant shuriken that was thrown at him from behind. When Aruka turned around he was shocked to see that it was his best friend Mizuki who had thrown the shuriken at him. Kiba, go on ahead and get out of here, Aruka is part of the test and he trying to keep you from passing the test, once I've dealt with him, I catch up with you and you can give me the scroll where you will have passed said Mizuki. Believing Mizuki's story Kiba nodded and told Akamaru to follow, who was starting to have doubts that what his master partner was doing and was suspecting that something was wrong. But regardless of his doubts he still followed after Kiba into the forest, when he ran off with the forbidden scroll still on his back. From his hiding spot behind some trees, Naruto watched the whole event unfold in front of him, he quickly realized after listening to Mizuki's little story to Kiba. That it was Mizuki who was the traitor and had used Kiba's grudge against him to trick Kiba into stealing the forbidden scroll for him. After Kiba had left, Naruto watched Aruka ask Mizuki why he had betrayed the village as he was Aruka friend and he trusted him. When Mizuki heard Aruka ask, he had just laughed and told him that he was never really Aruka's friend and he had just been using him to further his own career as a ninja. Where once he realized that he would get no further in rank or gain more power, he decided to steal the forbidden scroll and go somewhere else and gain more power than he ever would in Kanoa. He also explained that after he saw Kiba's grudge against Naruto, he decided to use it and get Kiba to steal the scroll for him, where everyone would chase after him and he be labeled the traitor. Where he would then met up with Kiba kill him and run off with the forbidden scroll, where by the time everyone realized the truth it would be too late and he would be long gone. After hearing this Naruto growled softly at Mizuki and glared at the man, as if their one thing he hated it was traitors as well as those who use people for their own selfish gains and since Mizuki was both. He was on Naruto's list of people he would have no regret beating to a bloody pulp. For the next few minutes Naruto watched Aruka and Mizuki fight an even battle between one another, but during the course of the fight, Mizuki used a Kawarimi no Jutsu to replace himself with a log when Aruka hit him with a kunai. After which he then ran off into the forest to get the forbidden scroll off Kiba, seeing this Aruka ran off after him, with Naruto following closely, but secretly behind him. As Naruto followed Aruka he saw him henge into Kiba, he then saw him meet up with himself Aruka, but when, Aruka, asked the disguised Aruka to give him the forbidden scroll, Kiba, then attacked, Aruka, and revealed that, Aruka, was Mizuk. After which the real Aruka released his own henge to show who he really was, the two of them fought one another for a short while, until Mizuki got away again, where Aruka decided to chase after Kiba and get him and the forbidden scroll back to Kanoa safely. Naruto went for follow Aruka, where after a few minutes he saw that Aruka had finally found Kiba with the scroll and Akamaru, seemingly he was in a small clearing not far from where Aruka and Mizuki were fighting for the second time. When Aruka arrived, seemingly Kiba was arguing with Akamaru about what was going on as seemingly Akamaru had concerns about this so-called test. When Aruka arrived he started to talk to Kiba and try convince him that Mizuki had tricked him and that there was no test. After a few minutes it looked like that Aruka might have gotten through to Kiba, but just as it looked like that Kiba might agree to come back to Kanoa with Aruka. 
Another giant shuriken was thrown at Aruka, but this time Aruka was not able to dodge as if he had moved Kiba would have been killed instead, hence the shuriken hit Aruka in the back wounding him badly. When Kiba looked up he saw Mizuki on a high tree top grinning sadistically at finally getting Aruka. After which he then jumped off and went over to Kiba with his hand stretched out. Kiba, give me the scroll, said Mizuki, with a friendly face on him now to try and convince Kiba to give him the forbidden scroll. Come on Kiba you didn't actually believe Aruka in what he said. He was just saying that because he wanted you to fail the test, since he didn't want you to prove that he was better than Sasuke or his new favorite student Naruto, as you saw how he favored him when he helped humiliate you in front of the whole class. At this Kiba began to have doubts about what Aruka had told him moment ago as to him what Mizuki was saying did make some sense. Kiba, don't listen, to him, run. Groaned Aruka as he was badly hurt from the Mizuki shuriken. Akamaru also started to bark Akiba, telling him not to trust Mizuki and to listen to Aruka and run back to the village. From his hiding spot Naruto saw that that Mizuki hiding a kunai behind his back and it ready to use it on Kiba if he gave him the scroll. Seeing this Naruto knew one of two things would happen the first being, that Kiba would give Mizuki the forbidden scroll, whereupon doing so Mizuki would stab Kiba with the kunai and kill him and then kill the wounded Aruka. The second outcome would also end in a similar outcome, where Kiba would believe Aruka and run back to the village with the forbidden scroll and Mizuki would chase after him and kill him, before he reached the village after which he would then kill the wounded Aruka. Seeing these two outcomes as unacceptable, as the both ended with Mizuki killing both Kiba and Aruka and getting the scroll and running off with it. Naruto knew that the only way to prevent this from happening was to enter the situation and stop Mizuki himself. Quickly coming out his hiding spot Naruto jumped out into the clearing right front of Mizuki and Kiba. When Mizuki saw Naruto, he began to curse as things just got more difficult with Naruto's arrival, as this was not how he had planned things to go as things had taken far longer than he had planned as well, where if he did not get away soon then more Kanoa shinobis would arrive or worse still Anbu. Kiba, don't give him the scroll, he's tricking you this isn't a test this it's all real, and if you give him the scroll you will be an accomplice to treason and be labeled a traitor to the village, said Naruto trying to reason with Kiba. As Naruto was saying this Mizuki realized that a golden opportunity had now presented itself to him, with Naruto arriving here, if I can present not only the forbidden scroll, but also capture Sunid sama son and bring both of them to Orokimaru. Then Orokimaru will reward me greatly with more power than I can even dream of, thought Mizuki with a small smile on his lips. See Kiba, it just like I told you they're trying to stop you from passing the exam think about it if this was real, why would Senju be here? He just trying to stop you from passing the test and you showing him up, said Mizuki, hoping to use his dislike of Naruto to get him to give him the scroll. Kiba, don't be an idiot, don't give him the scroll, said Naruto as he saw Kiba being hesitant. I'm no idiot Senju, and I, am not going to let you show me up again, cried Kiba angrily, where he dropped the forbidden scroll took out a kunai and charged at Naruto as he believed that Naruto was trying to sabotage his chances of showing him up. Kiba Yubaka, thought Naruto as he drew out of his katana and charged at Kiba with impressive speed for a gen in his age, where he quickly ducked under Kiba's kunai strike and then came up behind Kiba where he then quickly turned his katana around so that the back of the blade was forward and Naruto hit Kiba in the back of the head with the back of his katana, knocking Kiba out. When Kiba collapsed on the ground unconscious, Akamaru ran up to his master partner side to see if he was okay, which he was. Impressive, Senju, but not unexpected from a member of your clan as well as the son of the slug princess, replied Mizuki as he now held the forbidden scroll in his hands. Naruto did not respond to Mizuki's remark and just got into a stance to prepare to fight Mizuki as he was not going to let him get away with the forbidden scroll. Mizuki just smirked, when he saw Naruto getting into a sword stance and prepared to fight him. Listen kid, you may be more skilled than the average genin, but you're still only a genin, while I'm a seasoned and fully trained chunin, sneered Mizuki. Naruto of course did not respond to that either and just got ready as he was going to let. Mizuki made the first move, which he did as he put the forbidden scroll aside, and then took out and threw several small shurikens at Naruto, who quickly and skillfully deflected the shurikens away from both him and the unconscious Kiba and also made sure that they would not hit the wounded Aruka either. Unfortunately for Naruto the shurikens were just a distraction, where Mizuki came up from Naruto right hand side to try and knock him out with the blunt side of his kunai. 
Fortunately Naruto had saw Mizuki coming towards him at the corner of his eye and was able to spin around in time to block Mizuki's kunai with his katana. For the next few minutes the two of them traded blows against one another with neither giving the other much ground. As this was happening Aruka watched the two of them fight and could not help but be amazed at how Naruto a mere genin was able to hold his own in fight against a chunin like Mizuki. After another minute or so of fighting, both Naruto and Mizuki broke away from one another to take a break, Mizuki was panting slightly, but Naruto on the other hand was perfectly fine. As he had a lot of stamina thanks to the QB and thanks to his mother's physical and endurance training, hence he could fight like this for ages and still not be out of breath. Fant, Fant. I have to admit kid you're more skilled than I thought you were, but you're still no match for me and you can't beat me. So why don't you do yourself a favor and give up and come with me quietly and you would get hurt, said Mizuki. Thanks for the offer but I don't give up and I don't intend to lose especially to trash like you, said Naruto as he had yet to go all out on Mizuki, and even then all he had to do was keep Mizuki busy for a little longer as other Kanoa shinobis or Anbu would arrive soon. But when he looked over the wounded state that Aruka was in he was worried that he might go into shock and lose consciousness from the blood loss from the wound or the pain of the shuriken embedded in his back. Naruto then decided to end this now and help heal Aruka. Sorry Mizuki, it been fun and all, but it time to end this, said Naruto. Ha. Don't go making idle threats like the kid, you can't beat me, replied Mizuki, as he was confident that he could beat Naruto and still get away with both him and the forbidden scroll and deliver them to Orokimaru. I don't make idle threats, dot and I show you how I going to beat you, replied Naruto as he embedded his katana to the ground and then did a hand sign and cried out, Taju Cage Bunshin no Jutsu, multipliable shadow clone technique. After which a massive cloud of smoke appeared in the clearing, where once it dissipated, both Aruka and Mizuki were shocked to see over a thousand Naruto surrounding and filling the clearing all with their swords out and ready to fight. Incredible. Naruto knows how to do and has fully mastered a forbidden rank jutsu, as all those clones are real not illusions, thought Aruka in amazement. Impossible, where did all these clones come from, how could he even create so many? Cried Mizuki in complete disbelief. Get him. Cried Naruto and pointed the now terrified Mizuki, where all 1000 Naruto shadow clones attacked at once and pounced on Mizuki, who stood no chance against all of them and could only scream out as they bet him into a pulp. Once Mizuki had been dealt with, Naruto went over to Aruka and pulled out the giant shuriken out of his back and began to heal him. At first Aruka was surprised that Naruto knew how to heal him, but reminded himself that Naruto was Sunid's son, so it would be natural that she taught him some healing ninjutsu. Fortunately the wound was not as bad as Naruto had though as Aruka flak jacket had protected him from any serious harm, where Naruto was able to heal the small wound. Are you okay Aruka sensei? asked Naruto as he helped Aruka sit up on a nearby tree. Yes I'm fine Naruto thank you, replied Aruka with a small smile, where he then looked at the now beaten and battered form of his so-called best friend Mizuki and could not help but sigh sadly. For even though Mizuki was never really his friend, Aruka had still considered him as his friend, hence it did not lessen or ease the feeling of betrayal and sadness that their friendship meant nothing to Mizuki at all. Are you sure you're okay sensei? asked Naruto at seeing the sad look on Aruka's face. At this Aruka smiled again, but it was a sad smile, yes Naruto I will be alright in a little while, said Aruka. It was then that Akamaru then came up to Naruto and started to pour at Naruto's leg, asking him if his master partner was okay. When Naruto felt and saw what the pup was doing, he quickly realized what the pup wanted to know. Don't worry little guy, Kiba will be fine I just knocked him out with the back of my katana and he waken up in a few minutes time, although he will have a quite a headache when he does. At this Akamaru barked happily that Kiba would be okay and went back to Kiba to be there when he woke up, after which Aruka then turned and spoke to Naruto. Naruto I want to thank you for not only stopping Mizuki, but also saving both my life and Kiba's. That's okay sensei, replied Naruto with a smile, you would have done the same from me, besides what are friends for. This of course caused Aruka to smile and nodded where he and Naruto shook hands. After which, a team of Anbu arrived in the clearing and were led by a female Anbu wearing a porcelain a fox mask and had long red hair that fell down to her rear. Aruka-san are you okay? And what happened here? Asked the red-haired female Anbu. 
Aruka spent the next few minutes explaining to the Anbu what had happened, where he told then how Mizuki tricked Kiba into stealing the Forbidden Scroll and how Naruto fought and defeated him. After hearing this, the Anbu were impressed at how Naruto was able to defeat Mizuki so easily, even though Mizuki was only a low-level chun and it was still impressive. Pretty good kid, thanks for the help, spoke Fox, where she then ordered one of her team to pick up Mizuki and send him into interrogation. While she and others would escort Aruka to the Hokage's residence and bring both the unconscious Kiba and Forbidden Scroll back to the Hokage's residence as well, so that the Hokage could debrief both Kiba and Aruka personally. She also told Naruto he was not needed as the Hokage had told her to let Naruto go to which Naruto nodded and left to return to his apartment, where the Anbu and Aruka followed suit and headed back to the Hokage's residence. Hokage's office. From his mystical crystal ball, Sarutobi had watched the whole event from the moment that Kiba had exited outside the village wall to the moment that Naruto comforted and defeated Mizuki and to when the Anbu arrived. After the event Sarutobi turned off his mystical crystal ball and was quite proud of his surrogate grandson, for stopping Mizuki and for how strong he had become, although he knew that he had yet to see Naruto's true potential. Barely even in the village 48 hours and you have already created quite a stir in the village Naruto, something that has not been seen in it for decades. I look forward to what else you will do to liven the village up, while you hear, though Sarutobi with a slight chuckle as he waited for Aruka and the Anbu to arrive in his office. That will be it for this video if you want more comment down below, like, subscribe. And see you guys later.